Our scripture passage that we're going to be looking at this morning is from Mark 15. So after Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, things start to, to turn a little bit for him. Um, so this is what we're going to be looking at. Hear now God's word from Mark 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things, so again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner, whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. And the crowd said, Barabbas, Barabbas, release Barabbas. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked him. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, we confess to you that we are a part of the crowd that yelled, Crucify him. That we are the reason that you came to this earth. You are the reason that you gave up your life. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed this to us in your word. Lord, as we look at this passage, we ask that you would open up our eyes, open up our ears, and open up our hearts by the power of your spirit to accept the message that you bring to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, Palm Sunday which is today. It's also sometimes called Passion Sunday. This is the last official Sunday in Lent, and this is um, considered the start of Holy Week. So Holy Week is the week that leads up to Easter, the week when we look at the, the arrest of Jesus, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, and eventually his resurrection after three days. And for us as Christians, this is, well, these are the most important events in our faith. Without these events, our faith would be meaningless. Without the death of Jesus, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there would be no new life. All hope vanishes and we live a meaningless existence here without these essential events. These are the events that the whole liturgical calendar is centered around. This was the pinnacle of the Christian year. 
in the ancient church. Well, this morning we experienced Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem with the palms, with people shouting Hosanna. But now we're going to look at how things turned for Jesus and how he was considered a criminal and he was sent to be crucified. So to do that, we're going to look at Jesus' trial before Pilate, and we're going to look at uh, three different perspectives. We're going to look at it um, through the eyes of the Jewish leaders. We're going to look at it through Pilate's eyes. And then we're going to look at it through Jesus' eyes and what he experienced. So we're going to start where the passage starts, which is with the Jewish leaders. Now, I don't think, as far as my education goes. I don't think that uh, they are Christian Reformed back then, but it does say that they met as a council. The NIV translates it as they met as the uh, Sanhedrin, but this is them meeting as a council made up of chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law. And up to this point, they've been pretty ticked off at Jesus. Way back in chapter 3, remember this is chapter 15, so way back in chapter 3, Mark's gospel, the Jewish leaders, they get together and they plot how they're going to get rid of Jesus. They plot how they're going to kill him. Because just as Pastor Rich said in the children's message, Jesus was a threat to them. The Jewish leaders viewed him as a threat to their authority. Because this met, these group of men, this, this, this ruling group, they're the ones that hold all of the power. They have all of the authority. They interpret God's law and they determine how the people should live. But Jesus comes onto the scene and he begins to shake things up. He begins to eat with sinners. Jesus begins to heal people on Sabbath. He doesn't make his disciples fast. He does all these things that Jews are not supposed to do. But he doesn't do it because he's rebelling. No, he does this because he has a higher authority that he's claiming. Well, in chapter 14, in the scene right before the trial with Pilate, Jesus is before the Sanhedrin, and they're questioning him. The high priest asks him point blank, he says, Are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of the Blessed One? And quite clearly, Jesus says, I am. But he doesn't end there. He actually says, You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now what Jesus is doing, both of these metaphors, these images, with the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, coming on the clouds of heaven, he takes these from the Old Testament. And these are specifically geared and specifically pointing to God's authority that he is going to set up with his kingdom. God is going to bring his kingdom to earth and he's going to set somebody over charge of this kingdom and this person is going to rule. And in these passages that he's quoting, Jesus is saying that that person is me. The one to whom God gives all authority, glory, power, and dominion. Every person on heaven and earth will bow their knee to this one person, including the Jewish leaders. Jesus says, yes, that's me. Well, now, of course, the Jewish leaders are upset by this. They want to see this man completely taken out of the picture. This ordinary man who is claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be the more powerful one. He's claiming to be the fulfillment of all the sacred scriptures. And so the high priest, in a show of dramatic action, he tears his clothes, he accuses Jesus of blasphemy, and the council convicts him to death. And so what they do is they take him off to Pilate, as we saw at the beginning. They take him to Pilate because Pilate has the authority to execute criminals. But the high priest and the council, they can't come to Pilate and say, Hey, Pilate, can you kill this man because he is claiming to be the Messiah? That would mean absolutely nothing to Pilate. He wouldn't get it because he's a Gentile. He doesn't speak their religious lingo. So they have to come up with a way that convinces Pilate that this is in his best interest. And so they say, Jesus is claiming to be 
the king of the Jews. So this is the perspective of the Jewish leaders, that Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah, these really bold claims. Now Pilate, or Pontius Pilate, as we often hear him referred to, he is a Roman prefect. And as a Roman prefect, this means that he is in charge of a small region, and this his region is Judea. Judea, Judea, along with other areas in this this Palestinian region in Israel, was under Roman occupation at this time. It's under Roman control and Roman authority. So Pilate is the one who's in charge of this piece of Roman property, and it's his responsibility to collect taxes. He's supposed to keep the peace, and he's supposed to keep Caesar's assets secured here. So Pilate's main investment in this trial that's brought to him is maintaining the peace. So for him, this whole controversy revolves around this title that's given to Jesus as the King of the Jews. Because in the Roman Empire, in Caesar's Roman Empire, Caesar is the head honcho. For somebody to be considered a king was to threaten Caesar's authority to threaten his claim over sovereign rule and complete dominion. So Pilate asked Jesus, he says, Is this you? Are you the king of the Jews? Now this is no small charge. Anybody that was claiming to be a king or claiming to have authority, well, they were to be fiercely stomped out. Being called the king of the Jews was a political statement. It meant that Jesus was the leader of a group, a group that was a potential threat to Rome. They were insurrectionists. They were revolutionaries. They were rebels. So this is what Pilate has in mind when they bring this charge against Jesus, saying that he is the king of the Jews. But from Pilate's point of view, if you noticed, if you paid attention carefully in the reading, Jesus doesn't pose a threat from Pilate's point of view. He's just an ordinary guy that these Jewish leaders don't like, these Jewish leaders are envious of. Pilate says, what crime has he committed? What has this man done? Pilate is suggesting that Jesus is innocent here. He sees no reason for this man to be crucified. In fact, he's even willing to let him go if the crowd chooses Jesus over Barabbas. Now the third perspective, Jesus. What is Jesus doing this whole time? Not much. Mark portrays him as being pretty quiet. Pilate seems like he's at the tipping point here. He's about to side with Jesus, potentially set him free, so a couple of convincing words from Jesus about his innocence could probably go a long way. But Jesus, he remains silent. Here is an innocent man who is obviously not starting a revolution. He is about to be condemned to death, and he says nothing. The only response that Pilate gets out of Jesus is this ambiguous one. Are you the king of the Jews, he asks? You say, you have said so. What does this even mean? Is this a yes? Like, yes, I am the king of the Jews, or you say so, but I don't say so. Or is he saying, yes, but... In front of the council of Jewish leaders, Jesus was asked the question, are you the Messiah? And he clearly says, I am. He could have just as easily said this to Pilate. He could have said, I am the king of the Jews, yes, but not in the way that you think. I'm not looking to start a political revolution here. He could have defended himself in front of Pilate, saying that these leaders were just out to get him. He could have pled his innocence, and Pilate probably would have believed him. Well, do you remember Job? Through this whole Lent series, we've been looking at this man, Job, who once had it all, but then he lost it. His wealth, his family, his friends turned against him. His health is destroyed. You remember him? Job does nothing to deserve the hardships that come upon him. Job knows that he's innocent. And does he keep silent? Did Job keep silent? 
No. Chapter after chapter is Job defending himself. Job claiming his innocence. We just heard two weeks ago Pastor Rich preach from Job 23 where Job is saying, God, I want a trial with you because you know that I am innocent. I can defend myself before you. If I stand before you, you know the way that I take. When you have tested me, when you have tried me as judge, I'm going to come forth as gold because you know that I haven't done anything. Job is desperately desiring this trial so that he can be heard, so that he can be proclaimed as innocent. Now here's Jesus with this golden opportunity to plead his case for all to hear, not just Pilate, but the religious leaders in the crowd. A golden opportunity. The trial is actually brought to Jesus. And instead, this innocent man He maintains his silence. He maintains his silence and he allows them to lead him to the cross. Well, in the words of New Testament scholar Eugene Boring, here is not the powerful Son of God who acts, but the truly human Jesus who has resolved to suffer and die according to the will of God. Well, Jesus didn't die because one of his 12 closest friends betrayed him. Jesus didn't die because of the envy of the Jewish leaders. Jesus didn't die because Pilate was too much of a coward, because Pilate placed crowd satisfaction above true justice. No, Jesus died because it was the will of God. Jesus knew that this was coming. Back in chapter 8, he tells his disciples that he must suffer. It is necessary that I am handed over. It is necessary that I am killed. We see Jesus agonizing over this reality in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he comes face to face with this reality that's set before him. He says, I know the pain that lies before me, Father. Take this cup from me, please. But he says, yet, not my will, but yours be done. Well, this has been the plan from the beginning. The divine counsel, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before all time began, they determined that God would save his people. But this salvation could only come through the death of God's very Son. The second member of the Trinity had to experience agony, suffering, and torture as a part of this plan. Well, Jesus maintained his silence. He didn't plead for his innocence because it was the will of God that he would give up his life for his wayward people, that he would pour out his blood for many, as he says at the Last Supper. And even in this story, This story that we just saw dramatized here, this is what it's pointing to. Now, Pilate gives the crowd the option to release Jesus or to release Barabbas. Now, Mark, the writer of this gospel, he's banking on these Jewish readers to know what Barabbas means. Now, in Hebrew, Bar is son of, and Abba, you know what Abba is? Father, yep. So Barabbas means son of the father. So here you have a man who is guilty of a crime of insurrection. He is worthy or deserving of punishment. And then you have Jesus, son of the father, the real son of the father, who is being charged for insurrection He's being charged for wanting to rebel against Rome. So we have these two men here who are essentially being charged for the same things. One is guilty, one is deserving of the crime, and one is innocent, not deserving of the crime. And what do we see? Jesus takes this man's place. The son of the father, the innocent one, takes his place and allows Barabbas to go free. 
Well, this is what Mark is pointing to in this passage. This is where the road we've been walking on in Lent leads to. Jesus came and he silently walks the road to the cross so that we might have life. Now, this is our perspective. Perspective number four. We are convicted criminals. We are those who have turned away from God. We thought that we knew better in our lives. We set ourselves up as the highest authority. And we said, God, I think that I can do it better than you. But in reality, the only thing that we're capable of earning for ourselves is death. Life without meaning. Vanity. Well, the innocent one has come for us. God came down from heaven and he offered his life for us. Our guilty lives for his innocent one. And he is calling us to respond. Now there are many of you who are making a profession of faith today. Well, this is what we are responding to. We're responding to this profession that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus Christ has been sent into this world to save us from our sins. We are professing that Jesus Christ is the highest authority. That he is the Son of God who deserves our obedience, who deserves our love, and who deserves our trust. The Lord has already stirred in your hearts to know this, to believe this. And now what you'll be doing is giving a verbal profession to what he has been working. And this is the same for all of us. God the Son came down for us to forgive us for our sins. He remained silent so that we could have life. We're going to see these professions of faith. We're going to profess our faith too as a congregation But first, our worship team is going to lead us in a song of response, a song of praise. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. When the music starts, I invite you to stand and sing.